Hi everybody, and welcome to our second part of our week three lecture for World Religions and Global Issues class, looking at intersections of religion and environmental issues. Uh, this final article we're looking at today is Laudato Si Encyclical from Pope Francis, um, also referred to as On Care for Our Common Home, which came out in 2015. Uh, we read chapter 6 out of uh, Laudato Si for this week, and in that we get a perspective, uh, another in relation to the two we've already looked at, on how religion and environmental issues can be um, thought about and intersected. Um, in this case, with an emphasis on issues of ecological education, and particularly the role of spirituality, um, as Francis understands it, in bringing about a global change in consciousness. As Francis writes, we lack an awareness of our common origin of our mutual belonging and of a future to be shared with everyone. This basic awareness would enable the development of a new conviction and attitudes and forms of life. A great cultural, spiritual, and educational challenge stands before us, and it will demand that we set out on the long path of renewal. So Francis argues in what we read for this week that this global urge to buy and consume more stuff which really is at the heart of this process of economic globalization that we looked at in the very first week of class, is also part of the problem, according to Francis, because it creates this false sense of freedom through consumer choice. When in reality, he argues, those who are really free are the sort of very small minority who wield economic and financial power. So part of the problem, he suggests, is that when people become self-centered and self-enclosed, their greed increases. And the emptier a person's heart is, he argues, the more he or she needs to buy things, own, and consume as we try to fill that sort of void in our heart. It becomes almost impossible to accept the limits imposed by reality. In this horizon, a genuine sense of the common good also disappears, which is a big concern for him. Obsession with a consumerist lifestyle, above all, when few people are capable of maintaining it, can only lead to violence and mutual destruction. And so this is the common theme and that we'll see throughout all of Laudato Si, um, as well as the chapter we read for this week, um, which is this thinking about how do we shift fundamentally our consciousness and the way we relate to kind of the broader world around us. So thinking about how we change our lifestyles, for example, Francis argues one uh, possible mechanism of doing that is through using our economic and political power through boycotts and other kinds of consumer actions. Um, precisely because uh, powerful individuals, when they feel that kind of pinch of economic loss through boycotts and other actions, there's a greater incentive for them to change what they're doing in response to these social pressures. But ultimately, um, you can only achieve so much with those kind of superficial measures, and we really need to go deeper. And so Francis argues, an awareness of the gravity of today's cultural and ecological crisis must be translated into new habits. Many people know that our current progress and the mere amassing of things and pleasure are not enough to give meaning and joy to the human heart, yet they feel unable to give up what the market sets before them. In those countries which should be making the greatest changes in consumer habits, which obviously would be the United States and, and the major industrial developed countries, young people have a new ecological sensitivity and a generous spirit, and some of them are making admirable efforts to protect the environment. We certainly see this with, for example, youth climate marches and the Fridays for the Future and other related climate strikes. But as Francis notes, at the same time, these young individuals have grown up in a milieu of extreme consumerism and influence, which makes it difficult to develop other habits. So one of the really the biggest challenges, Francis argues, is that how do we break through these consumer habits and develop a new mindset? And this is where, for Francis and others, ecological education becomes really central um, as one of the solutions to help try to address these challenges. So early environmental education, um, as he notes, was often really focused on just basic kind of scientific facts. Um, but over the time, so let's say maybe since the 70s or the 80s, um, environmental education has evolved to include a critique of the myths of a modernism, sort of the modernity that we think of, grounded in this idea of utilitarian mindset. So individualism, a belief in unlimited progress, competition, consumerism, and the kind of what we would describe as sort of neoliberal free market economics today. But it also he argues seeks to restore the various levels of ecological equilibrium, establishing harmony with both ourselves and with others in relation to nature and other living creatures, and even he argues with God. 
So Francis refers to kind of this process as developing an ethics of ecology or becoming sort of ecological citizens or developing an ecological citizenship, which he argues in a sort of other parts of Laudato Si, um, we can start to put into practice through what he describes as an integral ecology. And this is important for Francis and others because he argues laws and regulations can only get us so far, and they don't really address the root problem of climate change. So only by cultivating sound virtues, he argues, will people be able to make a selfless ecological commitment. A person who can afford to spend and consume more but regularly uses less heating and wears warmer clothes shows the kind of convictions and attitudes which help to protect the environment. And he lists a number of other examples as well, um, some of which we've already talked about in the first part of this lecture. These kind of acts, Francis argues, have their own value and can actually contribute to kind of larger systemic changes um, and can take place anywhere in both religious and secular educational settings and other spaces. So as he argues in the Laudato Si excerpt we read for this week, by learning to see and appreciate beauty, we learn to reject self-interested pragmatism. If someone has learned to stop, not learned to stop and admire something beautiful, we should not be surprised that that person treats everything as an object to be used and abused without scruple. And importantly, he notes, if we want to bring about deep change, we need to realize that certain mindsets really do influence our behavior. Our efforts at education will be inadequate and ineffectual unless we strive to promote new ways of thinking about human beings, life, society, and our relationships with nature. Otherwise, the paradigm of consumerism will continue to advance with the help of the media and the highly effective workings of the market. And we can see this idea of the relationship between kind of mindsets and influences on our behaviors. Um, when we looked at the case studies from Zambia and from Malawi, thinking about how you know, that tension between traditional um, ecological practices and religions through TEK and Christianity, particularly charismatic and evangelical forms of uh, Pentecostalism, changed people's ability to adapt to local environmental responses and even changed the way they thought about um, possible ways of adapting. So it would be another way we can think about the way that our sort of you know mindset or worldview, the kind of broader social environments we're embedded in, um, have an important impact on how we think about a whole range of issues, environmental as well as others. So what we really need, Francis argues, is an ecological conversion that's driven by faith and spiritual conviction, which can address both our sort of interior mental world and also our relationships with the external environment. So as he notes, so what they all need is an ecological conversion, whereby the effects of their encounter with Jesus Christ become evident in their relationships with the world around them. Living our vocation to be protectors of God's handiwork is essential to a life of virtue. It's not an optional or secondary aspect of our Christian experience. So really you see here the, the importance for Francis of trying to not just think about the way our religious understandings, at least in the Christian context here, um, might allow us to think about our relationship differently, but that we actually have sort of a, a positive religious obligation to put those beliefs into action in the world around us. And as an example of what this might look like, he points to St. Francis of Assisi, and the, often dubbed the patron saint of nature, and who's often celebrated as sort of a perfect embodiment of kind of a religious expression of care for nature, and even seeing sort of the natural world as a divine expression of God's sort of creative abilities and honoring it because of that. So you commonly see pictures of St. Francis, both sort of contemporarily and in earlier sort of in his times, um, depicted sort of with many animals uh, sort of all interacting together. So the sheep, um, in this case, the lamb and the wolf, the fox and the rabbit, um, species that might normally not be um, interacting together is seen in this kind of harmonious way. Uh, one common example is pointed to is his Canticle of the Creatures. Um, you can see a couple excerpts here from that where he says, Praise be you, my Lord, through sister moon and stars. In heaven you have formed them, lightsome and precious and fair. And praise be you, my Lord, through brother wind, through air and cloud, through calm and every weather by which you sustain your creatures. Praise be you, my Lord, through sister water, so very useful and humble, precious and chaste. Praise be you, my Lord, through our sister Mother Earth, who sustains us and directs us, bringing forth all kinds of fruits and colored flowers and herbs. Um, so this would be the kind of expressions of um, nature reverence that Francis sees as being really part of an important uh, long historical lineage within Christian traditions. 
So when we think about this idea of ecological conversion, Pope Francis talks about certain attitudes that he sees as helping to promote I and mean, bring about this kind of ecological conversion, such as uh, feelings of gratitude and generosity and recognition that the world is God's gift to um, humans or to everyone, really, not just humans. Um, a loving awareness that we're all connected to all the sort of life around us and what he describes as a splendid universal communion. Seeing all of creation as reflecting a part of the divine with a message for us to be able to learn. And finally, recognizing that God created sort of nature and the universe or the cosmos more broadly uh, perfectly and that humans have no place or right to try to change and tinker with this natural order. So as he argues, Christian spirituality proposes a growth marked by moderation and the capacity to be happy with little. It's a return to that simplicity which allows us to stop and appreciate the small things, to be grateful for the opportunities which life affords us, and to be spiritually detached from what we possess and not to succumb to the sadness for what we lack. And you can actually hear interesting echoes here of sort of the non-attachment um, philosophies you find in um, Hinduism to some degree, but in Buddhism um, probably most clearly. So he notes, this implies avoiding the dynamic of dominion and the mere accumulation of pleasures. Once we lose our humility and become enthralled with the possibility of limitless mastery over everything, we inevitably end up harming society and the environment. Many people today sense a profound imbalance which drives them to frenetic activity and makes them feel busy in a constant hurry, which in turn leads them to ride roughshod over everything around them. So Francis is hoping this ecological conversion can help kind of push back and change that uh, broad global trend that he's pointing to here. But ultimately, it's important, he reminds us, to think that um, ecological conversion is ultimately about sort of an attitude of the heart and changing our, our, our heart, as it were. Um, and it's a recognition of the many ways that we are sort of living together and how we can harm people and the planet and live in ways that, that are not sustainable. But by slowing down, learning to use less, and embracing an ecological lifestyle, we can begin to change how we relate to the planet and to each other, he suggests. Now, ultimately, these changes must happen, he suggests, and others obviously argue as well, if we want to ensure a future for everyone on this planet. And this is really the central message of Laudato Si. And we're facing a climate crisis, and we need to utilize and mobilize all available resources, um, of which religion is one of the central possible avenues to bring about global um, action on climate change. So as he argues, we must regain the conviction that we need one another, that we have a shared responsibility for others in the world, and that being good and decent are worth it. We've had enough of immorality and the mockery of ethics, goodness, faith, and honesty. It's time to acknowledge that lighthearted superficiality has done us no good. When the foundations of social life are corroded, what ensues are battles over conflicting interests, new forms of violence and brutality, and obstacles to the growth of a genuine culture of care for the environment. And we've certainly seen the way that these sort of battles over conflicting interests and new forms of religious violence and brutality have emerged in our readings last week around religious violence and um, religious, um, sort of militant religious activism. So he suggests that these beliefs, when put into practice through things like ecological conversion and ideas of integral ecology, not only can help promote peace and social harmony, but can also foster more broadly what he refers to as a culture of care. So as Francis suggests, to put these ideas into practice, we don't have to become directly involved in politics and government, although certainly some individuals find that useful, but we can find many different ways to make these changes. So he suggests, for example, um, we can show concern for a public place like a building or a fountain or an abandoned monument or a landscape. And we can strive to protect or restore or improve or beautify it as something that belongs to everyone. So the sense of the common good and the communal um, benefits. And around these community actions, he argues relationships develop or are recovered and a new social fabric emerges. These community actions, when they express self-giving love, can also become intense spiritual experiences. So you think about the way in a kind of a Christian context that um, some mission work or something like Habitat for Humanity both brings people together around the common project um, that has a benefit for the community, but can also be deeply uh, meaningful for individuals participating in that experience. Now, Francis also points out that in Christianity, especially through the Eucharist, so the bread and wine, um, the sacraments, we are intimately connected to the natural world. 
also through the use of oil and holy water, through practices like baptism. Those are all regrounding us in this sort of natural elements, as well as the many references to fire and flames and color within um, not just certainly Christianity, but many, um, in fact, almost all religious traditions. Um, those are all important elements in one way or another. And as Francis notes, water, oil, fire, and colors are taken up in all their symbolic power and incorporated into our acts of praise. Encountering God, he suggests, does not mean fleeing from this world or turning our back on nature. So kind of in conclusion here, Francis reminds us that ideas like the Sabbath and the idea of a day of rest are central to both Jewish and Christian religious practices. In fact, they have their origins in sort of valuing rest, both for people and animals on the land, which we'll remember this is really where these religious practices first began. They came out of the need to create a time for draft animals to rest, to let the fields lay fallow and recover, so that we didn't overwork and exhaust the land and um, other creatures. But these were also importantly times of celebration, often related to harvest cycles and planting cycles. And they really emphasize these ideas of community solidarity and mutual aid, people coming together to work for kind of their collective good. So as Francis reminds us, rest opens our eyes to the larger picture and gives us renewed sensitivity to the rights of others. And so the day of rest centered on the Eucharist and the Christian traditions sheds its light on the whole week and motivates us to greater concern for nature and the poor. And hopefully such reflections and practices, Francis suggests, will help us to realize that everything is interconnected, which in turn invites us to develop a spirituality based around that sense of a global solidarity. And it's really in such expressions, Francis argues, that we might be able to form the basis of a new spiritual awakening that he called for at the opening of this essay, and sort of a renewed appreciation for the value of nature and our place within it. And in this way, we get a really a clear glimpse um, of how religious traditions, in this case Christianity and particularly Roman Catholicism, can be mobilized to bring about these ideas of ecological conversion and integral ecology in order to help address this sort of large looming global environmental crisis embodied in climate change. Okay, that wraps up our lecture for week three. Just a few quick reminders here about class assignments for this week. Uh, make sure you watch the videos that are on our weekly schedule page um, to go with these readings. Our third discussion post will be due Wednesday, July 14th, by the end of the day in the class discussion forum. And again, your two peer response posts will be due Friday, July 16th, and by the end of the day in the discussion forum. Okay, that's it for week three, everybody. Thanks, and I'll talk to you again soon.